morning. Uh, let's go ahead and bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful to you for your uh, uh, for the for this opportunity, Lord, to gather together with your people, to study your word, to think about your goodness, think about how you are the one who uh, makes our worst days good and makes this life worth living. Help us, Lord, to remember that life is about you. It's about serving you. It's about trusting in you. It's about following your way of doing things. Uh, Lord, help us to be the kind of people who are not only enthusiastic and excited about you, but we're excited about, uh, about telling others about you and about making hard decisions that would bring you glory. Lord, be with us today as we study. Uh, help us to not just learn, but to apply, to change, to be the people that you want us to be. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. First uh, Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off, so i got to take a breather here for a minute or two. Uh, while we get started, got my wire all weird. Feel like I have a bug on my on my neck. I'm sharing way too much independent information. Here we go. All right, First Peter, chapter five. This remote coming apart. Goodness sake, what a day! All right, First Peter, chapter five. Somebody read verse one through five for us again. Okay, so we started talking about this on Wednesday night, talking about the, the elders and their job, and we particularly focused on that first part of over overseeing, not overseeing out of compulsion. Um, and, and what is it, why is it, that an elder would even want to do the job of being an elder? Because it is hard work, it is sometimes demeaning work, it is often depressing work, but it is necessary work. And so, now that being said, I, I've painted a really bleak picture of eldership. It's also rewarding. Uh, it is also um, exciting to see when there are successes and when you see brothers and sisters do well and make hard decisions. Uh, there's a lot of, of good that goes with it. And so there, you know, we, we tend to, as we often do, focused on the negative and not always focus on the positive. So let me ask, and since we have several of our elders in here with us, what are the positives of being an elder? Okay. Okay, very good. Seeing spiritual growth, seeing people's understanding open up about the changes. What else? to be an elder to answer this, uh, what are the positives of being an elder? Okay. Yeah. So there's a sense in which part of the good of being an elder is knowing that you're doing hard work for God. You know, just like Paul talks about, I think it's over in Philippians chapter 3, about the, um, uh, the well, I want to turn over there and I don't want to mis misquote it or butcher it. Uh, but he talks about this idea of uh, forgetting uh, all the difficult things. Uh, my goal is to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. He talks a lot about the good of experiencing the bad. And, and there's a sense in which that's true of eldership in a, in a way. Anything else? Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, there is a depth of relationship that should exist between shepherd and sheep that probably doesn't often exist between sheep and sheep. Meaning, you know, I, I might have certain issues, difficulty, struggles that I will share with my elders that I might not share with everybody. And, and they get to know me intimately in a way that probably most other people don't get to know me. And so there's, there's just that growth and depth of relationship that's possible. Keith? Okay, so you yourself get to develop in a lot of ways, or maybe in deeper ways, than you would outside of that service. So you grow in your knowledge, you grow in your service, you grow in your suffering, you grow in your, um, and related to service, but you grow in your ability to humbly interact with others. You know, there, there's that side of it. Anything else? Okay, yeah, I mean, and again, because of the depth of knowledge of different situations, your encouragement changes some. Uh, what you can say, how you can say it, the depths to which you can say things, uh, that you can help build and construct and help that person in a lot of ways through encouragement. Uh, there, there, and it, again, I, I didn't want to leave us like we did Wednesday, sometimes painting this bleak picture of this role. It's a good role. And, and I will say, from a preacher's perspective, good elders make a world of difference. Bad elders do too. But good elders can make a world of difference in how successful and how enthusiastic and the growth of a congregation and the health of a congregation. Good elders make a world of difference. And that's why God set it up the way he did, so that these men would lead the flock, would lead the local church families toward God uh, and, and find those green pastures and still and those, those different uh, illustrations that often get used with shepherds. So, you know, again, I, I, I wanted to point that out partly because, you know, here elders, they do what they do not out of compulsion, but because it's something that is worthwhile to do. Okay, if it were about enjoyment, I know very few elders who would stick with it. You know, just, just to be honest. Same's true of preachers. So it's uh, if it were merely about enjoyment, but it's because there is work to do that is bigger than the individual. That's the way I like to word it. The work you do is bigger than you, and therefore it's worthwhile doing. Uh, also, it's interesting here, not out of greed for money, but eagerly. Why would that statement be made about shepherds? Okay, has anybody ever in here ever thought about eldership in a lucrative standpoint? That it's a lucrative position, Keith? So turn back over there to First Timothy, I think it's chapter 5. You say two, I say five. We're going to see who, I, I don't, <laughs> I can't remember. Um, chapter five, it is interesting here, verse 17 and 18. The elders who are good leaders are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker is worthy of his wages. We don't tend to typically 
and our modern way of doing things pay the elders. But we could. It is most definitely a biblical precedence for that. Uh, that, that proverb of do not muzzle an ox while he is threshing is a statement that we often apply to preachers, but to be honest, it, it's really about elders. It's about making sure they are um, made capable of doing the hard work of preaching and teaching as elders. Uh, it also means that elders should be preaching and teaching. Another side of eldership that, again, we don't often think about because of the way most churches are set up. But an elder is one who is, you know, part of shepherding is leading to food. Well, what is food for God's flock? The Word of God. And so that ability, that's why one of the qualities in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 is able to teach, or as your version might say, apt to teach. Uh, that is something that elders should be involved in doing. Okay. So I have a little bit of a different perspective on the way it was handled back in the first century based on a little bit of, of cultural or historical study that we tend to be very formal and business-like. Uh, part of the reason we are that way is because of certain expediencies we have accepted like church buildings and mortgages and power bills and all of those types of things. So there has to be money in place in order to take care of those responsibilities. If you eliminate the church building, the power bill, and all of those regular expenses, the treasury, the whole concept of treasury changes. Okay? And what you see described, likely, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where he says, set some money aside, or, or lay aside, and um, again, I'm... Still coming off of my head being chopped off. So here we go. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, about the collection, do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches on the first day of the week. Each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collection be made when I come. Uh, there's a lot of debate on that passage of Scripture as to, well, is it setting aside and saving individually well, if that's the case, then there would be need to be a collection when he came. Or is it meaning set aside into some sort of treasury that you have a regular access to? Um, but it, that doesn't seem to jive with the idea of set something aside and save, because that seems to sound more individualistic. So which is it? I think it's a little of both. Uh, and what I mean by that is this. Uh, you imagine, you know, kind of reimagine the church outside of church buildings and pews. You know, we've all gathered together in Keith Maddox's living room because they were small churches and they probably could have done that in most places. So we've gathered together in Keith's living room and we've, it's our regular meeting and part of our regular meeting is, all right, so uh, Benny let me know this week that they're a little bit hard up. They weren't able to make sales for the past several weeks, and they're struggling to be able to buy food at the marketplace. And Nathan goes, okay, I'll help with that. And Nathan has set money aside and saved so that he can be a contributor to the needs of the saints. And part of contributing to the needs of the saints is paying Barry, Richard, and Chris, making sure that their needs are met, because the work they are doing is not at the leather shop or at the, the you know, uh, at the market. The work they're doing is working with the local flock. And it's part of us contributing to the needs of the saints, not necessarily contributing to the needs of the treasury. Um, and again, that does not mean the treasury is wrong. Don't take what I'm saying and pendulum swing too far. I'm not saying a treasury is wrong. A treasury is expedient. It is an expedient that becomes necessary because of other expediencies. And that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unbiblical about that. Uh, but it, it does change a little bit the way we imagine this idea. 
Um, the way we imagine this is a very modern idea. I mean, banking systems, when were those created? I mean, you see how that changes things a little bit? Okay, when I don't have money, I've got pigs and chickens, how do I pay the preacher? With pigs and chickens, right? So the preacher gets a dozen eggs, which would be fantastic these days at the price of eggs. You know, it, it, you, you look at that, I mean, that, that is in a bartering agricultural system, a lot of your payment and taking care of one another is based on bartering and agriculture. It's not based on a financial banking system. Okay, nothing wrong with the financial banking system. So again, don't take this too far. Uh, you know, we tend to exchange everything for money. Our goods that we work for, we change, exchange for money, and then we barter with money. And so we just have brought that modern bartering system into the church in order to take care of the responsibilities of the church. That being said, there would be nothing wrong with us bartering and, and doing things different. Several years ago, this is going to get me way behind, but several years, I think I've told you all this story before. Several years ago, we had a Tom Hamilton come to a meeting for us, and instead of paying him out of the treasury, have I told you this story before? So instead of paying him out of the treasury, we paid his expenses out of the treasury, which he drove back and forth for all three or four nights of the meeting. And so we paid his gas, we paid a little bit for food, but that was a very small amount. What we did instead was we talked with the congregation and said, you know, Barry, if you benefit from what Tom preaches, you share with him personally what you think his preaching was valued at. Okay? And, and we did this for, for several reasons. One is we felt like there is an, you know, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you're having to decide whether this preacher is worth being paid or not, you know what happens? you pay better attention to him, okay? Secondly, uh, part of our reasoning for doing that was we were low on funds in the treasury, so it, it just helped us to be able to make some ends meet. Uh, but third of all, uh, one of the reasons we did it was because there's a biblical precedence for that. You know, Galatians 6.6, 6, share with those who have benefited you spiritually, share with them physically. You know, that is a biblical precedence, and so we wanted to create that. Now, I asked Tom several months later how he fared. To the, I mean, it was individuals with Tom, so I had no idea. I knew his expenses were taken care of, but I didn't know if he was, you know. So he told me, he goes, well, Adam, he goes, actually, we, uh, he goes, I probably ended up at the end of it with about the same as I would have gotten paid anywhere else. He goes, so it worked out fine financially. He goes, but let me tell you. I had more conversations about what I was preaching about that weekend than I have ever experienced anywhere else, ever. And, and it, it just, it, he was amazed. And he asked, he says, is that kind of how they always are? I'm like, no, they never comment on my preaching, which might had more to do with my preaching than it did with, uh, with the people. But uh, it, it was interesting to see that. We tend to be more personally involved when we are financially personally involved. And there's a lot of disconnect we experience by the treasury concept. You go back to elders here, not overseeing out of compulsion but willingly, not out of greed for money but eagerly. If you are being paid on a barter system, can you imagine maybe some elders got paid a little more than others? That there could be some who would do it because it could be lucrative? Because they could maybe keep some of their contributions private or secret and be able to get a, get a little more than anybody else? I'm sure that happened. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of teaching when you start looking at the apostolic fathers and such. Um, even in the Didache, um, which is uh, one of the earliest Christian writings that's not in our Bible, uh, the very first chapter talks about if you receive money you don't need, it is a shame to you and you should be accursed for it. And so just that idea of because they were very much in an individual personal sharing model, 
there were some who took advantage of that. Uh, and that was something to be aware of. And that's what Peter's talking about here. Don't, elders are not to take advantage of the system. Okay? We've eliminated that because we don't pay our elders anything. But it doesn't mean we couldn't. Doesn't, and again, not because of uh, benevolence, but because the work they do is worthy. And, and that's a perfectly acceptable way to do things. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. Are there elders who struggle with lording it over? Not here, of course. We're not talking. But have you seen situations where that's true? Absolutely. Uh, and elders, that is a shameful thing for elders to do. Elders are not kings. They are not lords. They are not rulers. They are servants with certain authorities. And, and they need to recognize their role in leading a flock, okay? Um, now, are there times when elders need to rebuke? Yes, that does not necessarily mean they are lording it over somebody. If their goal is to help someone go to heaven, and that requires a rebuke, that is not the same thing as lording it over. And we need to make sure we understand that. You know, uh, elders have a hard job and i love the way i think it it might be in first timothy 5 i can't remember it might be in a yeah man now it's gonna bug me where that is but this idea there's a, a statement made about not making an elder's job difficult um so just that idea of of you know we should do what we can in order to uh, make sure that elders are loved on just like everybody else so yeah man Yes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And Matt, you know, Matthew 23 makes a big deal about that. If you expect these high expectations out of everybody else, but you're not even doing it yourself, that's lording it over. Okay? And that, again, that, that's not what elders are supposed to do. Just like Jesus, the chief shepherd, did he do what he did because of financial gain? Did he do what he did out of compulsion, or did he do it willingly? Willingly. Did he lord it over us, or did he walk before us? He walked before us. Now, he is lord, but he is not a, an authoritarian lord. Uh, he, is, he is leading us in the same way uh, our elders should do that for us. And as is typical of any sort of relationship description, you have both sides of the relationship talked about here. So you've got the elders, but then you also have you who are younger be subject to the elders. Uh, I do find that interesting that the non-elders are called the younger. Okay, is that always true age-wise? Is that always true maturity-wise? Not really. Why do you think it's elder versus younger? I'm just curious as to what your answers are here. Why do you think it's described that way, Keith? Okay, yeah, uh, and, and I agree with that. It, it's really more of a, a, probably an accommodative statement trying to just make sure we understand there's a separation between these two groups of people. There's the elders and the not elders. Um, not elders just doesn't sound as good as younger. So, um, but that, that, that idea is, is here. So, uh, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. Now again, who does that apply to? The younger or everyone? Everyone. So this, this is, while the uh, younger should be subject to the elders who are leading them and guiding them and bringing them to food and water and taking care of them, 
all of us need to approach this whole thing with humility. Uh, and again, I, I would say that the solution to all three issues Peter brings up that could occur in eldership are issues of pride. So whether you're talking about those who, who act out of compulsion, meaning, well, I'm somebody and therefore I've got to do this job, or whether it's somebody doing things for greed, or whether it's somebody who is doing, th you know, lording it over others, those are all issues of pride. Uh, all of those are solved by some humility. And so we, you know, j all of us need to respond to one another with humility. Uh, it's also interesting, again, keeping this in the context of the whole book, Paul has talked about masters and slaves. He's talked about husbands and wives, right? And now he's talking about church relationship, the elders and the younger. Uh, as you deal in any relationship we have, the answer is probably going to be humility. That is the basis for, you know, the kind of the foundation for any good relationship, humility. Okay? And again, all of that relates back to our relationship with God, which is what he moves on to talk about. So somebody read verses 6 through 9. Okay, so it goes back to sufferings again, right? Because what is really the whole point of this book? That wonderful four-letter word, hope. And he is reminding everybody of our hope. And so our hope is found in right relationships. Our hope is found in righteousness. And those are really the two places where we need to hang everything. Okay? Uh, so again, humble yourselves, and he will exalt you at the proper time. I love that phrase there at the end, uh, mostly because that's the phrase that uh, our elders will say, Adam will get up and preach at the proper time, and I always wonder what happens if I get up and preach at not the proper time. Am I going to be in trouble? Um, yeah, just, uh, yes, okay. So uh, it's... Uh, uh, but no, just, just that, I, why, why is at the proper time an important phrase here? Do what? Yeah, I mean, it, this is one of those, if they're suffering and being persecuted and struggling, where's the exaltation? Yeah, like, you, that, that's what we want to know, is when is this going to be over? When will things be good? Where's the exaltation? Right? We're supposed to, you know, we're doing, we're the good guy. And, and the answer is, it'll come at the proper time. In due time. Who's in control of that? Nancy? God. Yeah. So that, that, that's important to remember. That all of this comes back to God's plan, not our plan. And we'll, we'll get back into that at the end of Second Peter, about God's timing of things and not our timing of things. So, uh, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. So again, if we're trusting in God to exalt us at the proper time, while you've got worries and cares and anxieties and difficulties, where should you put them? In the one who's in control of it all, right? Let him handle the worry. You let it go. Realize God cares for you. God's going to do what the right thing to do. Well, trust him. Trust him. He will, he will handle this. And that is an extremely difficult thing to do, but a wonderful thing to be reminded of. The funny thing about that is, you know the one time we don't want to be reminded of that? Yeah, we're in the middle of a mess. Like that, that's, well, you know, just calm down. God will take care of it. When? Like that, that's all right. Like we, we, we get upset about that. But 
Peter here talking to a general audience is letting them know, okay, it, it'll be okay. God will exalt you. It's still coming at the proper time. Until then, let him handle it. Just, just keep your head down, grit your teeth, ball your fist, and move forward, right? Just let him take care of it. Be sober-minded. Have we heard that already in this book? We have. So he's coming back to that here at the end. Be clear-headed, uh, I think is, a, is a, a, a good way of rewording that. And be alert. Same idea again here. Uh, what's interesting to me about this is when did he say this before? Anybody remember? I actually had it in my head and now I've lost it. Where? See what? 1 13. Somebody else say 13. Thank you. Um, 1 13. No, I'm in 2. That's why I'm like, no, that's not right. I'm not right. That's the problem. All right. So, uh, with your minds ready for action, be sober minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. So, you've got that same idea again here. Um, so that, again, be, when is the exaltation he's talking about? According to 113. At the resurrection, at the end, when all this is over with, the exaltation will come. So until then, hold on. Be, be, be sure you just hold on. Uh, and so, uh, again, realize the danger. Your adversary, the devil, is walking around looking for anyone who can devour. Resist him. Okay? Make sure you recognize the danger of living in this world. The devil's going to try to get you down. Okay, Chris? Um, my quick answer is put all your cares on him. <laughs> I don't know how to reword that. I like to view this like children uh, because, again, I'm in the middle of that. We've got a four-year-old all the way up to 16-year-old in our house. And it is amazing to me the difference between the four-year-old and the 16-year-old when it comes to anxiety. Who do you think stresses out more, Gibson or Maple? Gibson. Why? Do what? Okay, yeah, maybe. But again, I can make the argument the other way that because of the ignorance of the four-year-old, they have more to worry about because of the unknown. I think it comes back to trust. Maple doesn't worry about stuff because mom and dad got this. Mom and dad have this. I'm not worried about it. She doesn't have to worry about food. She doesn't have to worry about the, when she wants a snack. She doesn't have to worry about um, you know, messing up on a school test or, you know, all those types of things. She hasn't developed an independence that allows her to feel like all of this is her weight to carry. Because right now in her life, mom and dad carry all the weight, right? It's when we start taking the weight on ourselves that we start worrying, that we start experiencing anxiety and stress and difficulty. What Peter's saying here is get that childlike 
faith back in your life and let God carry the weight again because honestly, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Right? Quit being so arrogant as to think you are in control. Quit being so pompous as to think that it all depends on you. It doesn't. So instead, be firm in your faith. Faith in who? Yourself? Faith in who? God. God's got this. Be maple. Be maple with God. Let God carry it for you. Okay? And that, that uh, again, that, that is uh, an important thing. And I love the idea of casting. We always think of that in terms of fishing. But it's really the idea of throw. Throw your cares away from you toward him. Okay? Just, just toss them away. They're not, they're not yours. Okay? Resist the devil. Be firm in the faith, knowing the same kind of suffering. So again, realize you're not in this alone. There are other people who are also suffering. God's taking care of them. God will take care of you too. Okay? Uh, last little section here. The God of all grace who, established, who called you in his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. I love that passage of Scripture, by the way. If you do not have that underlined in your Bible and you write in the Bible you have, underline it. Because it, it is just uh, what an incredible promise that is. I wish we'd use that instead of guide, guard, and direct us. Uh, I wish we'd use restore, establish, strengthen, and support us. So, uh, and then after you have su uh, suffered a little while, to him be dominion forever and ever. I love, again, that last phrase. Let him have control. Let him have dominion. That's the way to cast your cares on him. Through Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I consider him, I have written to you briefly in order to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends your, you greetings, as does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And so again, kind of wrapping up the ideas here, make sure your trust is where? In God. God is the one you trust in. Uh, realize what you're going through is the same thing many are going through. That doesn't mean it's any less difficult, but at least you know God is familiar with your situation, right? Uh, would you rather go to a doctor who treats your ailment all the time or a doctor who's never seen this before in their life, right? I mean, same kind of thing. God, God knows what you're going through. So trust in him. He's got this. Let him take care of it. And then I love this idea of Sylvanus here. If you remember back, uh, I think it's, it's interesting that, that a lot of the letters, I couldn't remember on First Peter, a lot of the letters start with multiple author names. And people always try to say, well, then that means Paul wrote it, but then this person delivered it. Peter doesn't do that. This letter comes from Peter, and then he specifies at the end. Who's going to deliver it? Sylvanus. Okay, Sylvanus, a faithful brother. He, um, uh, through him either meaning he wrote it for Paul or he's delivering it for Paul, uh, he's written to them. So stand firm. Uh, and then there's this, this strange idea of Babylon, which we're going to spend more time talking about when we get to the book of Revelation. Uh, some people believe this is talking about Jerusalem. Some people believe this is talking about Rome. In First Peter, there's really no good way to answer it except for traditionally... Peter went to Rome at some point, but we're never told that from a biblical perspective. From a biblical perspective, where did Peter dwell? In Jerusalem. So I tend to personally lean toward this being talking about Jerusalem, uh, although it doesn't, you know, again, specify. Why does he call it Babylon? South?
So it, it's one of those, Babylon is typically, it is a, a theme that would have recalled the concept of captivity. Okay, where, you know, again, where did they, um, Nebuchadnezzar came and captured the people and brought the good ones back to Babylon. It was a, a place of captivity. And that's really what's being used here, is that um, she, probably referring to the church, who is in Babylon, um, greets you. And so that idea of the, the church that is in either Jerusalem or Rome, those are the two typical places where this is uh, stated at, um, greet you. Some have even tried to open the floor and say, well, Babylon just means the world. I, I tend to not side with that either, just because Babylon, oftentimes through early Christian literature and through like Revelation and here, it seems to be referring to a specific place, not to uh, other places. In the book of Revelation, it gets a lot more specific as far as what Babylon is, and so when we get to Revelation, we will show you some of those examples. Yes? Yeah, yeah, very well possible, and not just them. I mean, it was a fairly open, con you know, well-known concept through many of the early church writings. Uh, and so, um, and again, it does get used as the place of captivity. Like, so it, it is used to seemingly refer to different places. I do think, biblically speaking, there's some consistency. And so, again, we'll get into that. I'll show you more specific examples of that when we get into Revelation. Uh, greet one another with a kiss of love. Do with that what you will. And uh, peace to all of those who are in Christ. I will say, at the uh, first congregation where I ever preached, there was a guy there named Herb Cat. He was a big, old, round fella, is the way I will describe him. Uh, always smelled of garlic. Uh, he was very Italian and uh, actually came from, um, from Patmos. That's where his family was from, uh, but had been in America since he was a little small child. And... Um, but man, he would come up, didn't matter if he was shaving or not, and he would plant the biggest wet kiss on the side of your face that you've ever received in your life, whether you wanted it or not. And uh, uh, and he, if anybody said anything, was, greet one another with a holy kiss. And he's saying, and when he said, I loved hearing him sing, because he sounds just like Louis Armstrong, kind of had that like raspy, rattly voice, that, and uh, he'd get up and leave. He was fantastic. Loved Herb Cat. Um, but it was one that it took some getting used to because that's not our culture, okay? Um, I, I think it's a perfectly acceptable thing to do, uh, but it is not our culture. And so understand that. Uh, our current culture is a fist-pumping culture, mostly because we're scared of shaking hands, many of us still, because of COVID and all of that. Uh, the point here is not the method of displaying love, but that the reality of displaying love. We should be loving on one another. And so make sure that we're building those kind of relationships where we are very assuredly displaying love to one another. Okay? That all makes sense? All right, that's all I'll say about that. Second Peter chapter 1. I want to read this section because, as my wife will tell you, the verse 3 through 11 was one of literally favor i've spent a lot of time in this passage of scripture because i think it is fantastic so uh simeon peter servant and apostle of jesus christ to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our god and savior jesus christ may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of god and of jesus christ his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these, he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, Endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing number, increasing measure, and they will 
keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. A little bit of a longer reading, I get that, but it all goes together, so it's kind of hard to, to separate anything out other than the first two verses here. Letter comes from Peter 2. Yeah, a, a general audience, right? Those who have received a faith equal to ours. No location mentioned. Uh, and that's, again, why we call these the general letters or the Catholic letters. They are common letters. They are written for a common people. Uh, may, again, typical greeting, may grace and peace be multiplied through you, to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord, or Jesus our Lord. Then he jumps straight into the meat. And he, man, talk about meaty. This little section of, of Scripture is uh, worth many, many deep studies. But we don't have time for that. We're going to kind of briefly go over it. I'm going to try to briefly go over it. Uh, I love several of the phrases that are used in here. First of all, verse 3 talked about this very well-known phrase. He has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, are required for life and godliness. So how much has he given us? Everything. Does that mean we have all the answers? I see a lot of no's and see some yeses. Do what? Okay, that's the key here. He's given us everything we need. That does not mean we have all the answers we want. Okay? Um, and, and, and again, you can argue, well, we don't have them, but they're there. Not really. Uh, there's a principle in Scripture, like Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed are delivered for us and our children forever. So, you know, there are things that God held back. Why? Because we don't need them. They're not necessary. They're not required. And so there are plenty of things in Scripture that we might not understand, uh, or maybe, let me reword that. There are plenty of things about life or about holiness and godliness that we might not understand. doesn't change the truth of them, and the things that are revealed we are expected to understand. Okay? Everybody with me so far? All right. Then you get verse 4, uh, which, which just has this really incredible idea in it that I don't know that we're going to get past this morning. Um, he, uh, these he has given to us very great and precious promises. Wonderful. Love that. Not hard to understand that part. So that through them you may share in the divine nature. What? What is that talking about? Share in the divine nature. Uh, we'll have to come back and talk more about that on, uh, on, on Wednesday. So uh, go ahead and read, continue reading Second Peter. Read it again and again and again uh, as we talk through it. Thank you. 